Good morning. So tests are graded. Um, hopefully you saw that. If you didn't, uh, I would highly suggest going and checking your notifications for your Canvas app um, to make sure you have lots of them turned on so you find out when teachers post things. Um, if you want to go over your test one on one, I would be more than happy to do that with you. We can do it during office hours or you can schedule a time during office hours. Obviously, there might be more than one person in there. So what we can do is um, if I have a group of people in my Zoom office hours, I can do a breakout room with just you and me. And then we can go over your tests and then I can just, you know, take turns going through everybody that wants to do that same thing. But we can always do an appointment as well. Um, I think that's it. I feel like there was something else I was going to say about it. But I think that's it. Yeah. Any questions about the test in general or any anything that's going on? Okay. All right, let me pull up our slides then. We're going to continue with chapter four. Oh, somebody asked in the the just me chat um, my side effects for the vaccine. So I had my first vaccine shot on Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and that night I was just exhausted. Like I think I couldn't keep my eyes open by nine o'clock, and then all day yesterday I was really nauseous and woke up with a headache. Um, so I just kind of kept eating all day, like little snacks and meals all day. Um, I was able to work all day, so it didn't affect me terribly, but it was just kind of annoying. But by the time like that 24 hour mark hit, 24 hours from the vaccine, I was fine. And I feel completely fine today. Although when I lift my arm above my head, it still hurts where I actually got the shot. So yeah. not, not enough to like prevent me from doing it, but I can feel where it happened. Okay, chapter four. The last thing we talked about on Monday was how to name cycloalkanes. And where we're starting with today is kind of a weird thing and we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, it's not something I would I'll actually have you do on a test. I just need you to know that it exists. And there's a couple of words on here that we do need to talk about. Um, these, the rings that are on this slide are called bicyclic. So by two cyclic ring. So it's two rings. Um, I like that little graphic up there. It's telling you that it's the same thing. So it's essentially looking down at that bicyclic or looking at it from the side. So this carbon and this carbon are the same thing. Um, this is how you name it again. I'm not even gonna go over it. It's not important for our test. It's not something that really comes up ever. It, when you need it in the future, if you do, you'll relearn it then, to be honest. Um, one word though that we need to talk about are the bridgehead carbons. The bridgehead carbons are the connecting ones. So let me do this in a different color here. Those are the bridgehead carbons, all the ones I'm going to circle in green. So it's the ones that kind of connect the two sides, the two pieces. Um, those can be important just because it's a label, but other than that, bicyclics, there you go. Constitutional isomers. Now we talked about constitutional isomers. Um, in a couple of our chapters, and it's probably something you talked about in general chemistry, but now that we are looking at bigger molecules and we're drawing them in our bond line drawing exclusively now, it is important to be able to recognize when things are the same compound or if they are isomers. So one of the ways to help us figure that out is something we've just learned if we're trying to decide if two structures are identical or if they're isomers, 
one of the ways to determine that is to number them and give them a name. So the two that are highlighted in green there, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. They're both five carbon chains with a methyl group on that middle, on that third carbon. So we would call these both three methyl pentane because they have the same name that tells us that they're identical compounds. So even though one of them has its arm to the side and the other one has its arm up, it doesn't mean that they are different compounds. It just means they've been rotated differently. The other way that's listed here is not something everybody can do. Um, the other way is if you look at these two compounds, I'm gonna erase my numbers on this one. If you look at these two compounds and you say, well, if I just turn this whole thing slightly, what's 30 degrees-ish, and I rotate this bond around, I can see that they're the same thing. Not everybody can do that in their head. I definitely could not do that in my head when I was taking this class. I can do it now, but I've been teaching this class for 15 years. So that's one of those spatial things that sometimes can click with you and sometimes can't. So there's kind of like a visual way to do this and a um, quantitative way to do it. And I guess might be the best way to say it. So we're going to practice this. Let me find my... Oh, wait, do I have practice ones? Nope, I think I just left a blank slide in case we want, we're going to, but no. There we go, this is what we wanted. Um, I also have a couple slides or a couple sections here on looking at different types of alkanes and stability and energy. So this is something we're gonna actually talk about in a lot of our chapters. And we're looking at which molecule is more stable and in chemistry, if something is more stable, that means that it's lower in energy. And we'll see this style of graph in a lot of our chapters. And really what it's looking at is if we take our molecule, so in this case, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, octane. If we take octane, burn it up with some oxygen. So we're doing a combustion reaction. It will produce CO2 and water. Okay, but what we're looking at here is how much energy is getting released when we burn that up. So we will do this type of analysis in a lot of our chapters as a way to show what type of molecule is more stable. And so what this graph shows us is that when we have just a straight chain versus when we have branched chains, when the, the one that has the most branching is burnt, it releases 5,452 kilojoules per mole compared to 5,470 kilojoules per mole. It releases less heat. So what that tells us is that it was already at a lower energy to start with because the amount of heat it needed to release to get to the same point was less. So you can think of it that it already had a little bit of a head start. It was already lower in energy. So that's a little bit more background information just because it's the first time we're looking at this type of graph. But here's the takeaway from this slide. Branched alkanes are lower in energy, which means that they're more stable. So the more branching, the lower in energy the alkane is. Exactly. And so this graph is giving us evidence of that, but this is the takeaway from the graph. Any other questions on that? Okay. Some real world stuff. So where we would find these alkanes out in the, out in the real world, and it's a huge range of stuff. So small alkanes, so C1 through C4, meaning methane through butane. Um, if we think about just their names, methane, well, well, kind of ethane, but propane, butane, we think of these in terms of things that we're going to light on fire. Uh, propane 
is what you buy in a big tank to hook up to your, um, your barbecue, uh, butane lighters. So these are things that get burnt usually. There's some type of fuel. We get a little bit larger. We have solvents, gasoline, jet fuel, heating oil, diesel. So notice that a lot of these are things that are providing energy sources. And then as we get larger, so 20 carbons or more, we get to things that aren't as liquidy. So we have um, oils and grease, wax, asphalt, tar. So as they get larger, they're going to stick together better. They're going to have stronger London forces. And so they're going to be more in that, I want to say tacky, but like more in that sticky category. So waxes and greases, things like that. All right. On Monday, I said that this chapter kind of has three parts. We've done the naming. What we're going to talk about now are Newman projections. Newman projections are a different way to draw a molecule. Um, we have been drawing molecules as a bond line drawing. And last year, last semester, you drew Lewis structures. And now, because we have these bond line drawings, we want to be able to see it in 3D. So we talked about dashes and wedges. Remember, a wedge means that it's coming towards you. And a dash means that it's going away from you. So this is our fancy chemistry way to say that there's 3D within our molecule. So if we have an ethane molecule, which is what all of these are portraying. So we have a CH3 bonded to a CH3. We have that dash and wedge. So we're kind of looking at it from the side. The sawhorse then is if we take that, that we're looking at the side and we just turn it slightly. So now we're looking at it from an angle, from a side angle. And then the Newman projection is if we, we have our dash and wedge, we have our sawhorse, and now we have our Newman projection. We're looking at it straight down the bond. So the way that we do a Newman projection drawing is there's a carbon in the front there. So that would be our, our carbon. And then directly behind that, so hiding behind it, is the other carbon of that bond. So the circle that's in the middle, this circle that's right here, is encircling the bond between the two carbons. So we're looking down the carbon-carbon bond of ethane. All of the red hydrogens are attached to the front carbon, and then all of the blue hydrogens are attached to the back carbon. Now, one of the things that you might be thinking that always kind of comes up is, well, how do you know what's the front and what's the back? Um, you'll be told in, in a question. So if you're asked to draw a Newman projection, uh, what did I draw here? One, two, three, four, five. I drew pentane. So if you were asked to draw a Newman projection of pentane, it would say draw a Newman projection of pentane going down the C2, C3 bond. So that would mean that carbon two would be my front carbon and carbon three would be my back carbon. Um, sometimes it's even shown with a little I, which I think I have on the next slide. Uh, it's definitely on our worksheet today, though, as well, but it, you'll be told. You don't have to guess that. Okay, I know this doesn't quite make sense yet. We're going we're gonna to practice it, though. So we're going to look at this structure, and we're going to draw the Newman projection. And I'm going to do the little eye method. <laughs> so I'll show you what I mean. Here's, here's my little eye. And we're going to look down that bond. So meaning that my, my front carbon will be carbon number two, and my back carbon will be carbon number three. So I'm going to start just by drawing the general shape of a Newman projection. So what that means is there's my front carbon. My front carbon is always going to have three things attached to it. 
even if those things are hydrogens, we draw them in with a Newman projection. This is the one time we can't ignore the hydrogens. I'm going to draw a circle. So that's representing the separation between the front carbon and the back carbon. And then the bonds for the back carbon, I'm going to draw in between. Okay, so now if I look at carbon number two, carbon number two has a chlorine attached to it. It has a methyl group attached to it. That's carbon number one. And it has a hydrogen attached to it. It also has carbon number three attached to it, but that's part of the Newman projection. That's the bond that is within that circle. So I'm just gonna fill in my chlorine, my methyl, and my hydrogen. Carbon number three has an alcohol, a methyl, which is carbon number four, and a hydrogen attached to it. So I'm just going to fill those in. So essentially, we're taking this structure, which we're looking at flat from the side, and we're turning it and looking at it directly down that bond. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, is there a way, do we need to differentiate which one's the front carbon? Are we going right to left or will that come after? Does it matter? You will be told in some way. So because there's a little eyeball here and the eyeball's looking at carbon number two, that tells me that carbon number two is the front carbon. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Yeah. Can you explain the methyl? Like how you got the methyl part? Yeah. So carbon number two is attached to carbon number one. That's the methyl that it's attached to. And same thing with carbon number three. Carbon number three is bonded to carbon number four. So that's the methyl that it's bonded to. So if we were to think of this as our butane chain, this is carbon number one. This is carbon number two. Carbon number three is directly behind carbon number two, and then that's carbon number four. So I've kind of made it in a weird U shape the way I've put them on my Newman projection, but those are the four carbons within our butane chain. Okay, so question in the chat says, are we assuming the hydrogen on carbon two is dashed when looking at the bond line? Okay, so that is a really good question that we haven't quite gotten to yet. So the way that this structure was drawn, it was drawn with all lines. It doesn't have dashes and wedges. We are gonna do one with dashes and wedges next and I'll show you the difference. But when it just has lines, we don't know if that chlorine and that alcohol group are dashes or wedges. It's not defined, it doesn't matter. And so where we put them on the Newman projection it can, as long as it's on the correct carbon, it doesn't matter which side it goes on. So when we have all lines, the locations don't matter. Now, in all honesty, you're not going to see them this way very much because the question was asking about dashes and wedges and Newman projections are a way for us to draw in 3D. So often we're taking something that has that 3D indication, the dashes and wedges, and converting it over to this Newman projection. So it's a good question. We're just, you're one step ahead of me. Any other questions on this one? Okay, let me see if I have, I do not. I'm going to add in a blank slide because I don't want to erase all that. I want right here. Why won't you let me click right there? Insert. No, home. Okay. Okay, we're going to do the same thing. 
with a slightly different structure. And I say slightly because it's almost the same thing. The difference now though, is that I'm using dashes and wedges to show some 3D shape in this structure. So we're gonna draw the Newman projection of this guy using this 3D dash and wedge system. I'm gonna, oh, let me give us a little eyeball to look at. We're gonna go down the same bond, but there's my little eyeball. We're gonna go right there. So we're gonna go from carbon two to carbon three. So carbon two will be my front carbon. Carbon three will be my back carbon. Again, I'm gonna start just by drawing my, hmm, I was gonna say I'm gonna start by drawing my general shape, but I think I'm gonna back off on that for a second. One, two, three, four. Okay, so carbon number two is my front carbon. It still has the same things attached to it. We have a methyl group, which is carbon number one. It has a hydrogen and it has that chlorine. Now, I'm going to draw my hydrogen into this structure because it can help us see everything when we want to see it in 3D. So if my chlorine is on a wedge, that means that my hydrogen has to be in the dashed position. So the hydrogen is kind of behind that chlorine. And then on carbon number three, we have the methyl group, which is carbon number four. We have the hydrogen and we have the alcohol. And again, I'm gonna draw my hydrogen in. And if my alcohol is on a dash, that means my hydrogen has to be on a wedge. Now notice the way I drew my dashes and my wedges. Both of my wedges are on the left. Both of my dashes are on the right. It actually doesn't matter if you do them on the left or the right, as long as they're the same. So meaning both wedges are on the same side and both dashes are on the same side. Because the idea is, is if we, so here's my, my fingers. If I kind of tilt them this way, these are both on, my pointer fingers are both on the same side and my thumbs are on the same side and my fingers are coming out towards you but I could just turn this way and now they're on the other side, but they're still coming at you. So when we look at the dash and the wedge, we're not looking at it completely flat. We're looking at it at a slight angle. So whether your dashes are on the left or the right just depends on if you're looking at it from this angle or if you're looking at it from this angle. You'll see it presented both ways, depending on what you're looking at. So as long as it's consistent, wedges together, dashes together, both are okay. Now, here's where it can get a little bit tricky. When we draw this, I like to make the minimal amount of changes possible because if you try and rotate it around or try and see it in a different way, the more movement you try and make, the more chances of error you're going to have. So when I turn this into a Newman projection, I wanna take this structure and all I wanna do is rotate it so that I'm looking directly down that carbon two and three bond. Now, when I do that, my chlorine, that's a wedge that's coming out towards me. So coming out towards you, as it rotates, around, I don't know if this is gonna work with the camera. I'm trying to think if my camera's flipped or not. Um, as it rotates around, that chlorine is going to be on the right-hand side. So I'm going to rotate this this way, I'm rotating it to my right. And I'm going to draw my Newman projection slightly different because my carbon number two has a dash and a wedge that are pointing in the upward direction. And that line, the carbon number one line is pointing down. So there's my carbon number two. When I fill in my pieces here, my chlorine is going to be on the right because I've taken this entire structure and rotated it to the right. And so my wedges that were coming out towards me have also rotated that direction. Here's my methyl and there's my hydrogen. Carbon number two 
carbon number four up here, this is in between the hydrogen and the chlorine, if we're looking at it from a Newman projection view. So there's a bond up here and then the two bonds down there. The one at the top is that methyl group. And then as I rotate it around, what's going to be right here? What's going to be on the right hand side of carbon number three? Will it be the hydrogen or the alcohol? The hydrogen. Good. As long as your dashes and wedges are drawn correctly, there will be a pattern. What I mean by that is my chlorine and my hydrogen were both wedges and my hydrogen and my alcohol were both dashes. Now you can't make the conclusion and say that wedges are always on the right or wedges are always on the left. It depends on how the drawing is made. What if your eye is looking up bond number three and you're rotating in a different way? So you can't make that general statement that it's always this or always that. Those never work. What you can do though is you can see patterns that if I rotate it this way, those wedges rotate together. So the wedges will be on the same side. Just as you're rotating, you have to figure out what that side is. Okay. Questions about this? I do have a question. So in this case, what indicates that we have to rotate the uh, carbon two? I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question, Mario. Why do we have oh. to rotate carbon number two? Yeah, in this case, we rotated carbon two, right? A little bit. Yeah, so we rotate the whole structure. So essentially, we're the dash and the wedge structure, we're looking at it from a side point of view. We're rotating the entire thing. So we're looking at it straight down that carbon two and three bond. So this right here is carbon number two. And then directly <laughs> behind that hiding in the back is carbon number three. Eight. Oh, okay. I mean, there is a couple ways to think about this. You could think of carbon number three, like being our pivot point and carbon number two is rotating rotating around carbon number three. If that helps you to see it, that completely works too. So you could think of that back carbon as your pivot point, which I think is actually how I think about it personally. Okay, perfect. That, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on the dash and wedge Newman projection? Okay. There's, of course, special language to go along with this. Um, we talked very briefly about steric strain in one of our chapters. So steric strain is just when there's stuff in the way, it causes some strain, it causes some higher energy. In this, we're looking at torsional strain. So torsional strain is when groups are close together because of the angle. We know that single bonds have free rotation. So we drew our Newman projections like, like all of these, where those atoms, those groups are as far away from each other as possible. But notice this one right here, all of those hydrogens are much closer together because this bond in that ethane molecule has free rotation. So it can rotate around and those hydrogens can move. So these each have, oh, sorry, my phone's trying to talk to me. It thinks I woke it up. No, go away, okay. <laughs> um, these have different names. Staggered and eclipsed. So I, I think that these names makes sense. Staggered is when all of the atoms are as far away from each other as possible, and it's going to be lower in energy. They're staggered. They're staggered around that circle. Eclipse, so if we think of an eclipse, something's going in front of something else, 
this is when those atoms are really close together. So we draw them a little bit separated, but that's because we don't want to draw them directly on top of each other just because it would make the drawing too messy. But this one is going to be a lot higher in energy because of that torsional strain. So up here where that's coming from, that high in energy is because it has electron repulsion because those bonds are close together. Remember the bonds are made of electrons and then steric strain, just meaning there's stuff in the way. So those atoms are going to be repelling each other as well. This is emphasizing that energy difference. So this is still ethane. Um, if we look at this and follow the red hydrogens, so there's a hydrogen on the front carbon that's shown in red and a hydrogen on the back carbon that's shown in red. And as we go through a full rotation around that bond, we go from a eclipsed to a staggered position. Two Gs. Um, and this is telling us the energy difference. The book also talks about how to calculate what that energy difference is based off of what the groups are. We're not going to do that. The number itself is not important. We just need to know that when it's eclipsed, it's higher in energy. When it's staggered, it's lower in energy. These are ethane molecules. So all they have attached to them are hydrogens. Of course, we're going to look at things that are bigger. We always start small and work our way up. If it's something bigger than a hydrogen, bigger atoms or bigger substituents are going to make that energy gap even larger. So the bigger they are, the more strain there's going to be. So we're going to look at this with, okay, good. We're going to look at this with butane. So I've kind of the graph pushed up to the top here because we're going to look at this with a butane molecule and how it rotates around. So we did butane a little bit ago with some things attached to it. This time though, we're just doing pure butane. And again, we're gonna look down that carbon two, three bond. So I'm gonna start by drawing a Newman projection and notice that there's letters up here. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F. So that means that we're going to end up drawing six Newman projections. So I'm just going to start with the first one. Oh, that let me let me make my lines a little bit cleaner. That was not a good start. Okay. Carbon number two. What is bonded to carbon number two? Our front carbon of our Newman projection. Oxygen. Yeah. Um, the CH3. Perfect. And what's the third thing? So a hydrogen, a CH3, and? And another hydrogen. What about carbon number three? What's bonded to it? The same thing. The same thing. Okay. Now, because the way I drew my butane, it doesn't have any dashes or wedges, the placement of these doesn't matter. So I'm going to put my methyl, my hydrogen, my hydrogen, my methyl. This is quite yet. We don't know if it's A through F. We're going to figure that out once we get them all drawn. But here's how we're going to draw the next Newman projection. I'm going to leave the front carbon exactly the same. Actually, I should have done these in different colors. Let me, let me fill this one in and then I'm going to go switch colors on the other one. It'll make it easier to see. Okay, so the back one's going to be in purple. Front one will be in, in orange. Okay, I'm going to leave the front one exactly where it's at. And what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the back one around. 
Now, again, doesn't actually matter which way you rotate. I just always like to do things the same way. If you stick to a pattern, you're less likely to make mistakes. We're going to be rotating this 30 degrees at a time. So it was in a staggered position over here. We're going to rotate it to the next position, which is eclipsed. So I'm going to draw it. Oh, that was a little too close. I was going to say I'm going to draw it right next to this bond. So I'm just drawing it right next to each of those other bonds. And my methyl, which is right here, it's going to rotate right there. So it's just rotating to the next spot. And then hydrogen, hydrogen. And so this is eclipsed. And so then if we, some of those lines are really wavy. <laughs> As we rotate to the next one, this methyl that's right here is now going to rotate right there. So we're again, we're rotating 30 more degrees. So I'm gonna fill in my orange ones, my orange ones that aren't moving at all. And then I'm gonna fill in that methyl. I'm using my methyl as my tracking device as I go around the ring because the other two are both hydrogens. So it's gonna be harder to track them because they're the same atom, even though they're in two different positions. So pick the thing that's unique. So there's my methyl, there's my hydrogens. So this is also staggered. Okay, next, there's my front carbon, looks exactly the same. So I'm gonna take that methyl and rotate it one more position over. So it's going to go back to being eclipsed. So there's my eclipsed template. So I'm gonna fill in my front carbon. So that methyl has rotated one more position going clockwise around the ring. So this is also eclipsed. We still have two more. I'm not sure where I'm fitting these puppies in. The one up here. So there's my front carbon. Nothing has changed with it. And then my methyl is going to rotate one more position around. So it's going to go right there. So we're back to being staggered. So I'm going to fill in that front carbon. And here's my methyl. And then we have one more spot for it to go. I'm gonna go down here. So there's my front carbon, hasn't moved. So the last spot for that methyl to go is it's going to be eclipsed at the very top. So last eclipsed one. Okay, we have six Newman projections. Questions about the drawings before we start labeling them, A through F. Wait, so to confirm, you always rotate it 30 degrees in between? If we're trying to draw every single Newman projection, then yes. Okay. And they're also kind of to add to that, if your goal is to draw every single Newman projection, if that's what the question's asking, or if you're doing it for practice, there will always be six. Because if we follow that methyl group around the ring, there's six different positions it can land in. Any other questions about the drawings to get us started? Okay, now notice that in our drawings, three of them are staggered, three of them are eclipsed. 
on our graph, we have six letters, A, B, C, D, E, and S. Three of those letters represent the staggered positions and three are the eclipsed. Which three letters do you think are the staggered positions? Good, I completely agree. It's the B, D, and F. So these three are my staggered, put it right here. And we know that because they're the ones that are at the lower energy level, which means that A, C, and E are my eclipsed confirmations. Um, I'm also using the word confirmations. I we should probably talk about that word for a second. So we use the word configuration and confirmation. Uh, they definitely mean different things. Confirmation means that you're literally just rotating something around or looking at it from a different perspective. Configuration is more about like moving things with on in the structure. So you take chlorine on carbon number two and move it over to chlorine number three. So it's a different molecule. So not a big deal, but just in case that I don't think that words come up yet. Okay, so let's look at the staggered ones, B, D, and F. B and F look like they're at approximately the same energy level, but letter D is a little bit lower than the rest. So that tells me that letter D is the lowest in energy, which also means that it's the most stable out of all six of these. So if we're thinking about this in terms of the strain, so we want things, we want to minimize that repulsion. We want to minimize steric strain. Out of our staggered structures, do we think, which one of these do we think is letter D? <laughs> I don't know how you're going to answer that. Let me give them some numbers. I'll erase these numbers and replace them with letters. But which one of those do we think is letter D? Two. I agree. So number two is going to be our most stable structure. And the reason for that is the placement of the methyls. The methyls are the two largest substituents attached to our carbons. And we would want them to be as far away from each other as possible. And so in letter D, they are completely opposite from each other which means that this is going to give us the lowest energy and the most stable structure. I'm labeling letter B and letter F, and really they're identical to each other. The methyls are still staggered, they're still separated, but they're close, closer together. So letter B and letter F still fall into that staggered category, but they're slightly higher in energy because our bigger groups are closer to each other now. And I'm using the phrase bigger group because it can mean anything. It just depends on what's attached to the two carbons that our Newman projection is focused on. Sometimes the biggest group will be a methyl. Sometimes the biggest group might be a benzene ring that's attached to it. It just depends on, it's all relative. It depends on what's attached. Okay, so you're so, saying that since like everything is opposite from each other, it's more stable instead of it being closer to each other? Exactly. The farther apart the bigger groups are, the more stable it's going to be. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think I need to do the other one in a different color. So I've covered this in colors. Okay, so let's do the eclipsed in red. So we have one, to, we have our three different eclipsed. And if we look at our three letters here, it looks like letter A is the highest in energy. So out of not just the eclipse, but out of everybody, this is the least stable or highest in energy. Those two things mean the same thing. And then letter C and letter E are approximately the same, or Actually, they're technically the same, but they, they're at the same energy level, level, same stability level. So out of the three that I have 
numbered, which one of those is going to be the least stable option or the highest energy option? Wait, does it just go in order? So it would be like number three. Um, yeah, I would say number three, too. Yeah, number three is definitely our least stable. So I'm going to erase number three and replace it with a letter A. Oh, I also erased part of my hydrogen there. So yes, letter A is our least stable. And then the other ones are B and C. No, C and E, excuse me. The reason why we labeled the far one as letter A is because our two largest groups, which are our methyl groups, are eclipsed. They're on top of each other. C and E both have eclipsed conformations, but our two bigger groups are farther away from each other. So the eclipsed conformations are higher in energy than the staggered because we have that overlap. But when we, but when we can keep the bigger groups farther away from each other, it's going to give us a more stable structure. And and there was a question of, do they go in order? And they do. So we definitely didn't start with them in order, but we could rotate around through these and they will go in order. So we kind of actually did them backwards. Um, let me do a quick little erasing and I'll show you. I'm just gonna switch my letter B with my letter F here, because remember those two were the same. And so if we switch letter B with letter F, notice that starting all the way over here, as we go th back through, so going through this way, we go through A, B, C, D, E, and F. We go through all of those confirmations in order. Questions about where the labels came from, where the structures came from, any of that? So again, this is talking about the specific energy levels and what those numbers are. Um, so just notice that when we have a hydrogen and something that's a little bit larger versus two things that are a little bit larger, the amount of, the amount of energy is increasing. So you don't need to know the actual numbers. We just need to know that the bigger the groups they are, the closer together they are, the more strain there is. Should we know the types of strains, like the torsional or stamp? That's a good question. Um, Derrick strain is something that's going to come up a lot, so you do need to know that. But in terms of Newman projections, we just know just know that they're strain. The specific types aren't really that important. Okay, thank you. Oh, do we have, let's see. That was the end of Newman projections. Let me see if there was more I want to talk about because there is something else that we didn't talk about yet. Um, I'm going to add, oh, this, this slide is so busy, but I want to add a couple labels on here. I never use the black on my stylus. We'll use it today. Um, we labeled A and D as the most and least stable but I'm going to add a couple actual more labels to this. And our labels for this, and let me see if I have them on. Don't think I do. Okay, so here's one word we need to know. Degenerate. So in chemistry, the word degenerate means that they're at the same energy level. So for example, letter C and letter E are degenerate. Um, but the ones that we singled out are the ones that we're going to give labels to. And for our staggered, when our two big groups are opposite from each other, this is our anti. 
So we give it just a special label because of the fact that it is, um, it is the lowest in energy. And then the other one that we give a special label to is when it's still staggered, but now the bigger groups are closer together. And so let's see, that would be letters C and E. And letter, I'm looking for my thing here, C. So these are called gauche, so G-A-U, C-H-E, and they both get the same label because they are both staggered and at that lower energy level of our staggered. So I'll put these definitions in a better spot for you as well. And then the D is the lowest energy of everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I know that's a horrible label on here, isn't it? So let me put them up here too. Um, this one is anti, letter D, and then letter F and B are gauche. And then the eclipsed ones don't get special names. We just often say that these ones are low energy eclipsed. I think you wrote the names in the wrong one. You put gauche for the eclipsed ones when you meant to put it for the staggered. Or am I wrong? Because you were saying staggered goes with gauche. Yeah. Oh, I did on my structures, didn't I? Yeah. You are completely right. I did it right on the graph. It's wrong on my structures. Thank you. This is what happens when my slide gets too messy. All right, so let me put this on a cleaner spot for you guys. We're going to add in an extra slide. Okay. So staggered, we have anti and gauche. And anti is our lowest energy and the big groups are far apart. And gauche is the higher energy of the staggered. So it's still lower in energy than anything that's eclipsed, but it's the highest energy of the staggered and the big groups are close together. And then our other option is eclipsed. And these don't get special names, but we have low energy eclipsed and high energy eclipsed. And low energy eclipsed is when we have the big groups far apart. And high energy eclipsed is when we have the big groups eclipsed or the big groups on top of each other. All right, that's much cleaner of a definition for you guys. Questions about those definitions? Okay. Let me look at my notes here, see if there's anything else. If I forgot those, I think that's it. All right. Cycloalkanes. 
Sorry, so, Professor, can yeah. you go back to the next slide really quick? Just okay. so, um, the one where we were doing the staggered and the eclipse. Yeah, that one. Uh, this crazy one? <laughs> no, the, the other one. This one. Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. You are welcome. There we go. Okay, so we drew some of these shapes on Monday. We talked about naming cycloalkanes. One of the tricks that goes along with these is when we have all these carbons in this ring in these geometric shapes, these are still all sp3 carbons. Remember sp3 carbons have a tetrahedral shape, which has a bond angle of 109.5. But if you think back to geometry class or elementary school, I don't remember when we learned these things. But when you think back to the angles within these shapes, most of them don't match that 105 degree angle. So a lot of these shapes have what we call angle strain. Angle strain is forcing these orbitals into a shape that doesn't quite match the ideal bond angle. So they are being forced to be closer to other electrons and forced into some electron repulsion. Some of them are obviously worse than others. These three are kind of in order of worst to getting better. Um, this top sentence, though, is really important. It says most cycloalkanes aren't flat. So when we draw geometric shapes, we, we draw them flat. This is how we learn how to draw them. But in reality, most of them have a little bit of a twist to them or a little bit of um, angles to them that makes them not flat. And the reason for that is they are trying to reduce that strain or reduce that electron repulsion. So cyclopropane is first on our list. So three carbons up here. It is flat. It's one of the only ones that's flat. And this one has the worst strain. The reason for that is because all of these hydrogens are eclipsed with each other. So it has torsional strain because it's eclipsed and it's forced into this 60 degree bond angle. So it also has severe angle strain. So cyclopropane is not a very stable molecule. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that it's going to react really quickly because those bond angles are, are going to be pushed to something that's not stable. Cyclobutane is next on our list. Not planar. So here's our cyclobutane. Um, if you look at the way this is drawn, those three carbons, those three black carbons, are, are flat with each other. They're in the same plane. And then this carbon is just a little bit lower. So it has just a little bit of a, a dip in the shape right there. So some of the hydrogens have a little bit of a eclipse shape. So they're going to have that torsional strain, but it takes that twist shape, that little bit of a downward turn there in order to make at least some of the hydrogen staggered. So it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but this hydrogen is in between these two and in between those two, that's how it's able to be staggered. So it has less angle strain than cyclopropane in order, and it's so making it a little bit more stable and it has a little bit less torsional strain because it takes on that twisted shape. Next, cyclopentane. So again, cyclopentane is not a flat shape. It has, again, that twisted shape. Um, 
so this one we can kind of almost see that like those three carbons are in the same plane and then the other two are a little bit twisted i know it's really hard to see in this i'll try and find a video to because also i would totally bring in big molecule kits and show this to you guys but I don't know how that would be helpful now because it's still on a screen. <laughs> but I'll try and find a good 3D video that might help you guys see this as well. Um, but because of the twist, again, we have less angle strain because it's a bigger shape. We have less torsional strain because we have more staggered, more staggered bonds. And so it is going to be the most stable out of these three. Cyclopropane is fairly stable. We see it quite a bit as we look at reactions and, and molecules in nature. But this does take us to the one that we talk about the most. And the one we talk about the most is cyclohexane. Cyclohexane is definitely not flat. It takes on what we call a chair shape. And I'm actually going to skip ahead to show you why it's called a chair shape. Oh, okay, here it is. Okay, it's stupid, silly pictures. But this is the drawing that gets used to show that it's a chair. So one, two, three, four, five, six carbons going around the shape. That's where the chair comes from. Okay, let's go back to this. When our cyclohexane takes on that chair shape, it's bending the, the carbons around so that they end up with 111 degree bond angles, which means that they are really, really close to 109.5. So it's going to have almost no angle strain and all of the hydrogens are staggered. So it's going to have no torsional strain either. I'm gonna grab my molecule kit. I'm gonna build this as we're talking. I don't know if me building it and showing it to you is going to help through video, but I'm going to do it and we'll, and if it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, no big deal. So when we build this, when we draw it, when we look at it, each of the six carbons going around the ring is going to have two things attached to it. And right now, what we're looking at is just cyclohexane. So meaning it only has hydrogens bonded to it. But of course, we're going to see this with all kinds of things bonded to it as we talk about it more. These hydrogens or these substituents have very specific positions as we go around the ring. So the one on the bottom here has them labeled as axial and equatorial. And the axial positions are all represented with a red triangle and the equatorial positions are all represented with that blue that blue circle so look at just the red triangles notice that they are all either pointing straight up or straight down so if you think of like the axis of the earth it points i mean i know it's i know it has an angle to it but it goes straight up and down and so these are the axis, the, the axials, they're going straight up and down. And then the blue ones are all going straight out. These are at the equator, equatorial. So kind of just a helpful way to remember the names. One, two, three, four, five, oh, one more carbon and I got it. The other thing is the last bullet point right here it says within the ring, opposite bonds are parallel to each other. So there's a big blank space on this slide because I'm going to teach you how to draw this as well. But let's talk about these parallel bonds. Okay, I'm going to color code this. 
Um, we're gonna start right here. So I'm just drawing on top of the one up here and I'm gonna color in these bonds. Those two bonds are parallel to each other. Oh, that is not the button I wanted to hit. Oh, I hit it again. Those two bonds are parallel to each other. And those two bonds are parallel to each other. If you can draw this with those parallel bonds, then you're doing great. And I say it that way, not to sound like a jerk, <laughs> but it can be very difficult to get this drawn correctly, especially as you're first starting this out. I'm still trying to build my structure. So here's how we're going to draw this. Here's how I draw this structure. And I'm going to draw it with the same colors that I just highlighted that one with. I'm going to start with the green. So I always start with drawing with what would be the seat of the chair. So I draw two lines that are parallel to each other that are just slightly off from one another. And then the headrest of the chair. So um, if we're looking at the one that has numbers on it, carbon number four would be the top of the headrest. So I draw that one and that one and then that one and that one. That is my chair drawing. To draw the substituents coming off of it, I will have this built at some point today, I promise. I'm going to draw in the equatorial positions first. No, I'm changing my mind. Sorry. I'm going to draw in the axial positions first. Um, the axial ones are easier. And so I was going to do the harder ones first, but I think doing the easier ones first makes more sense. So I'm going to stick to the same colors as our triangle and circle drawing. So I'm going to draw my axial positions in red. So each carbon going around that ring has an axial position and an equatorial position. And if we look at the carbons, some of the carbons are pointing up and some of them are pointing down, just like in our, our regular zigzag drawings. The carbons that are pointing up, the axial position goes up. So what I mean by that is up, up, up. Those are my axial positions for those carbons. And then my other three carbons, down, 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 those are my axial positions. So my ring right now that I have built, let's see, let me, well, I'll stop sharing once I get it fully built, but I have my red axial positions going around the ring. I will add in, hmm, I don't think I have enough to do blue. We'll do gray on my drawing or on my uh, build here. I'm gonna do my equatorial positions in a dark blue. These ones are a little bit trickier, but there is parallel lines still. So this one right here is parallel to these two and this one. So it's parallel to the seat portion of our chair. So equatorial, equatorial. My gosh, it is raining really hard at my house right now. And then Let's see, let's just do it in this color. This one is parallel again to that opposite bonds as we go around the ring. And then the two that are coming off of the middle are right there. This takes practice to draw. If you bought hexagon paper, a lot of times it comes with some chair pages in it, or it might have even come with a chair stencil. Um, you can buy just stencils that have the chairs on them. They're nice and handy. 
if you bought that, you're more than welcome to use it on the test. I will not judge your chair drawings on the test. The only thing that you could lose points for, for your drawing on an exam is with your equatorial and axial positions. Ooh. Lightning and thunder too. <laughs> Hopefully I don't lose power. Yes, you can use the model kits on the test too. Sorry, I'm mesmerized by the huge thunderstorm outside my window. If you draw a bond angle that's like right there, so it's like in between an axial and equatorial position, then I don't know what you're trying to show me. So that could lose you some points. Um, one way around that though, is if, you're, if your angles are just aren't good and you have one that's kind of weird, but then you draw one that's going up, I can see that one is axial and one's equatorial just with a bad angle. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a sec. I'm gonna make my own. Okay, so I'm gonna show you my, my, my build here. So this is my chair. The red pieces are all in the axial positions. The gray ones are in that equatorial positions. So I'm gonna turn it on its side. And as we turn it on the side, you can see the gray ones going away from the ring all the way around. I need like background color to put behind this. I'm not the best background. Um, and then the red ones are coming out towards you or coming away from you. And so as we turn it on its side, the red ones are pointing straight up and down. Okay, I'm gonna hold on to this. We're gonna use it again. Hopefully it's helping. Let me go back to my screen here. When we have the chair confirmation, it still does have some rotation within that shape. And it can rotate through what's called a chair flip. So if we think about it like a beach chair, we have the part that you rest your head on and the part you rest your feet on. The foot rest can flip up and become the headrest, and the headrest can flip down and become the foot rest. But of course it's not that simple. It goes through all of these variations in the meantime. Um, a half chair. So a half chair is like when your foot rest is now flat, a boat. So the boat's the only other common one that you need to know. This is also a boat up here. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so I can show you my boat. So I have this, I don't think this is helpful, you guys. I'm not sure though. Um, so this is my boat. The reason why the boat is not stable is because these two right here are so close together. If I move this back into a chair shape, they are far away from each other. But as I take this carbon, so the, carb the only carbon that my hand is touching, that's the foot rest of my chair, as I flip that up into now a boat shape, these two are running into each other. So this is called a flagpole interaction. It's like the flagpoles on the ends of a boat, um, but it, it causes steric strain because they're literally running into each other. And then to get to the other chair, we take the other side, what was our headrest and flip it back down. Now, oh, a little bit more tutorial on how to draw it. So feel free to go back to this slide, but there's nothing else to talk about on here. As we go through this chair flip, anything that was in an axial position becomes equatorial and vice versa. All right, let me go back to my original chair. So here's my chair. 
I have my red axial positions going around the ring, or I should say above and below the ring. I have my gray equatorial positions all the way around the edges of the ring. I'm gonna put this through a chair flip. So where my hand is right now is the current foot rest of my chair. And that's the head rest of my chair. So I'm gonna take my foot rest and flip it up. And I'm gonna take my head rest and flip it down. When I do this, I now have the gray substituents all pointing up and pointing down. Everything that was in the equatorial position has been rotated so that it is now in the axial positions. And everything that was axial, all those reds are now around the edges of the ring in that equatorial position. And again, I, I can't imagine that this is really that helpful in the way you're seeing it. I will find a video that shows the rotation for you guys. This is the first time I've taught this chapter online. So I didn't even think about that the models wouldn't be as helpful. Um, this slide is essentially telling us what I just said, that things go through that flip. But the other thing it's showing us is this top structure, our methyl right here is in an axial position. And I know that because it's pointing straight up. And then this methyl is in an equatorial position. And I know that because it's kind of pointing out at the side. So to go from that axial to that equatorial, this is going through a ring flip. Notice the percentages here, 5% and 95%. This is telling us that 95% of the time, this molecule will have the methyl in an equatorial position. The axial positions have more steric strain. So they're closer together. And if they're larger groups, it's going to have even more strain. There's going to be more chances for them to overlap or interact with each other. So we want to have the largest groups in the equatorial position. So this is going to be our more stable conformation because the large group, so in this case, the large group is a methyl because all of the other substituents are hydrogens. So the large group is equatorial. We're gonna draw some of these. Oh, here, we're gonna look at a couple examples and we'll do some drawings. Um, we can look at the same thing when we have more than one substituent attached to the ring. And so this is showing us a methyl and a chlorine attached to the ring. And it's showing it in dashed and wedged form. And our chlorine is in a wedge position. And so another way to think of that or another way to phrase it is to say that the chlorine is pointing up. So we have to kind of think of this as we're looking at this molecule. The wedge means that it's pointing up at us and the dash, the methyl means that it's pointing away from us or that it's pointing down from us. So as we take our flat dashed wedge hexane drawing and we switch it over to a chair drawing, we want to keep the same 3D shape. So in the first drawing, our chlorine is pointing up and it's axial. In the second, oh, sorry, started to say second drawing, but no. And our methyl is pointing down and it's also in an axial position. So we have represented the dash and the wedge by pointing them up and down. They're both axial though, because of the ups and the downs aren't dependent on axial or equatorial. If this goes through a chair flip, so meaning we've taken this carbon, 
pushed it down. We take that carbon and push it up. So this is going through a chair flip. Our chlorine is still pointing up. Our methyl is still pointing down, but now they are both equatorial. It can be hard to see the up and the down when we're looking at it from an equatorial perspective. I'm going to go back. Um, I'm going to go back to this drawing. I'm going to erase this, but I just want to use this as something to point out on. So I mentioned that the axials are always pointing straight up and down. So I feel like with the axials, it's really easy to see if we would label them as up or down. Up, up. Oh, sorry, I leaned on my keyboard. Up, down, down, down. The equatorials, because they're kind of out at the side, if you just look at the equatorial, it can be a little bit hard to see whether it's pointing up or down. But when you compare it to the axial, it makes a little bit more sense. And what I mean by that is this position right here, it's pointing to the side. But because the axial that's attached to the same carbon is pointing down, that means that this one has to be pointing up. And it is at a slight angle going up. It's just not as pronounced as the axial in the same position. Another way to see it or to remember it is as we go around the ring, it's every other one. So if I start at the one I just circled, then we go here, this equatorial is pointing down and then up and then down and then up and then down. Oh, and then up, we're back to the beginning. Okay, so hopefully that helps you see it a little bit. Let's go back to where we were. So this is asking which chair is more stable. Both of these are the exact same thing. This is almost like looking at the Newman projections. We're taking that same structure and we're rotating it around and we're saying, well, is it more stable to have the methyls here or the methyls here or the methyls here? This is essentially the same thing. And our answer to which one is more stable is this one. And the reason why this one is stable is because both of our large groups, so meaning everything except for the hydrogens, they're both equatorial. Now, when we drew this, if we had to have one axial and we had to have one equatorial, we would want the largest group to be equatorial. That would give us the most stable structure. Oh, we're almost done, aren't we? Time. Oh yeah, we have two minutes. Okay. So we, yeah, we'll start with practice for this next time. Um, trying to think what I want to leave you with. I'm going to leave you with this cis and trans because um, this comes up in the worksheet. Cis means same, trans means opposite. So when we refer to this in a ring, if we have two substituents that are on the same side, so meaning they're both wedges or both dashes, then we can label it as cis. And if we have two substituents that are on opposite sides, so we have one that's a wedge and one that's a dash, we can label it as trans. You can only do this with two substituents. If you have three substituents and you say it's trans, well, they can't all be opposites from each other. There's only two sides to the ring. So it only works with di substituted rings. Okay, we are at time. We do have a worksheet today. So we will log off of lecture, log on to lab and start our chapter four worksheet. 
hopefully my power won't go out in this weird thunderstorm. Okay, I will see you in lab in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, professor, super, super fast. Uh, so on the slides where it says like 4.13, which one you said that it was going to be like the most stable, the one with the axial chloride or with the- uh... The structure that's on the far right, the one that has both of them in an equatorial position. Okay, so if equatorial uh, groups means they're more stable, right? Yes. Perfect. And then, um, thank you, that was- Okay. Thank you so much, I'll see you in lab. Hi, um, I just had a follow up question about um, a question that came up in my SI and I was hoping you could answer it. Of course. Um, so um, I gave them this problem. Um, if you, is it possible for me to share my screen? I can yeah, kind yeah. of- I think I need to turn it on, but I will let you for sure. Nice, thank you. Um, oh, actually let me stop recording first.